explain risk appetite to board members and to executives of the non-financial services sort of sector companies is use a uh, what I'll call a pyramid visual. Right at the very top of the pyramid, you would have something called risk capacity, which is something a company wants to stay away from because it's really where the significant brand and reputational damage could occur if there's too much risk in a company. So basically under that on the pyramid, you would back off and define your risk appetite sort of underneath risk capacity. And then risk appetite would really be what you do uh, as you work towards your strategic plan as a company. That's the acceptable level of risk you would have to actually hit your strategy. And then on the, on the, again, on the pyramid underneath risk capacity, you have risk appetite. And then under risk appetite, you would have, I'll, I'll still call it risk appetite, but it's really risk appetite for each key business risk. <clears throat> so you would basically take each of your top 10, top 15, top 20 key business risks and develop an appetite or a tolerance level that's acceptable for that specific risk. And then finally under that, you would have on the pyramid, your key risk indicators, which I know we'll talk about in a bit, but those are what those are the way you sort of monitor against the appetite for each individual risk by risk. So um, that's the pyramid visual. Another way to, to even describe it easier is think about sort of uh, dials. You would have on the dial sort of low, medium, and high, and each of your key business risks, the risk owner would set the dial at low, medium, or high, and that would correspond to how much appetite you have for that specific risk. So if you set it at low, you don't have a very uh, big um, tolerance. So it's very conservative and you would manage and mitigate the risk that way, as opposed to setting it high or higher, where you would have, you would take more um, of a less conservative uh, view of the risk and maybe uh, take more, take more risk, if you will. Um, to really hit uh, certain objectives or strategies you would have. So that's another way sort of to describe it. At the, at the end of the day, what I would just say is that um, you have to take risk appetite, you have to define it, you have to push it out into the business, and people have to use it and leverage it to make risk-informed decisions. Otherwise, it's not worth much at all. I think about KRIs or key risk indicators, right? These are these are metrics, um, often quantitative metrics, but metrics or leading indicators um, of a particular risk. So you can sort of keep that risk in check against the appetite. So maybe I can talk about a couple of examples of, of KRIs to maybe bring it to life um, for folks. If you think about a company who might be a retailer and the retailer has a key risk around, let's say, product quality that they want to make sure they keep in check throughout a given fiscal year. Um, one of the one of the KRIs could be, let's say, the number of product returns. Um, another KRI could be um, the number of customer complaints about a product. So you're, you're you're measuring certain things that will indicate whether you have issues around product quality or not, and you can sort of attack it and jump on it and try to deal with it if you see those indicators sort of going out of whack, if you will. Um, maybe another example that's real common among any company in any sector today is uh, cybersecurity as a risk, right? Um, so, so a KRI around cybersecurity could be uh, the presence of malware that's on the network. So um, as you find more presence of malware, you can sort of sort of think about how that's going to turn openly into a cyber breach at the company. So that's an indicator. The, the malware could be an indicator to make sure you either ramp up or make the mitigation more robust to sort of keep that risk in check through that KRI. You know, in terms of where to find KRIs, you can certainly search the internet. They have a lot of examples, but here's really how it should work within a company. Um, the respective risk owner for particular risk should be the one that's held accountable to come up with a set of KRIs that would be customized uh, for the risk that he or she is the owner of. Um, and that should be used to measure the appetite through the KRIs and keep the risk in check. So um, that's a long way of saying it really has to be customized for the company and by the risk owner, specifically to the risk he or she owns.
unfortunately, they're very um, relevant today. You know, geopolitical risk, a good example would be global risk events that happen out in the world that either directly or indirectly impact a company, let's say here in the US, if you will. So obviously, unfortunately, we have the, the Russia-Ukraine war, we have the Israel-Hamas war. So you have those type of global events going on. And you might be thinking, well, how does that affect me as a company? Well, it has a very big impact because let's take an example of, um, let's say a company has uh, supply chain as one of their key business risks. Well, if that company is trying to get materials, let's say shipped into their manufacturing plant, and it's either coming from or through these war-torn areas that are that are that are having these global risk events occurring, that causes disruption in a supply chain. So you can see how a geopolitical risk would actually cause directly or indirectly a risk for, a, let's say, a company far, far away. Um, in terms of what you can do about geopolitical risk, what I recommend to companies is to do uh, scenario analysis. So play a lot of what if games and say, if this um, global event happened, how would this impact one of my key business risks? And you run a bunch of scenarios and the board should see those and the audit committee should see those scenario analysis results that the risk owners are doing. Um, another tool you could use for geopolitical risk is what I call interconnectivity analysis. So if you take your set of key business risks as a company, you then look in, and try to see which ones are connected to other ones. So if risk number three hits, does that trigger number five and number six? So for instance, the um, a pandemic that we all dealt with years ago was a global risk event. Um, um, that set companies off around telemanagement risk, you know, the way they work, hybrid or, or, or not hybrid, that triggered, again, supply chain disruption. So that interconnectivity analysis and those scenario analysis tools are really good ways to understand not only um, what geopolitical risk could do to your company, but rich, which risks could trigger other risks within interconnectivity analysis. So that's how I would best describe what to sort of deal with and how to tackle geopolitical risk. Assurance mapping is something that I recommend to companies to do probably at least annually. Um, the exercise ultimately shows um, which risks are being either too redundantly covered by different risk assurance functions or assurance functions, or which risks may have gaps in coverage. So think about a big spreadsheet and down the left-hand side would be all the key business risks at a company. And across the top of the spreadsheet would be all the company's assurance functions, uh, internal audit, ERM, SOX, quality control, health and safety, compliance, whatever it is based on the sector the company operates within. And you would sort of, put X's or check marks on which functions are covering which risks. And if you go across the risk row at the end of that analysis, you can see which ones are being hit too often, or maybe too redundantly, and you're fatiguing the business. Or you can see gaps and maybe the risk isn't being, isn't being hit by any or not enough of the assurance functions. So when we talk about assurance functions, we're talking about mainly second line assurance functions and third line assurance functions, i.e. internal audit. So it's a great analysis to do annually to see if you have a gap in coverage or just as bad, too much coverage. And again, you're fatiguing the business on that particular risk. 